Uh, thanks everybody for joining. There's people from all around the world, from Singapore to California on the call. So good morning or good afternoon or uh, good night, wherever you're joining from. I'm really excited to have you all join today for this month's webinar uh, with two really fantastic speakers. Um, just a quick note at the start, you'll notice in the, probably the bottom right of your chat box, there's a, a Q&A button. Uh, at the end, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes to ask questions of the, the speakers today. And so wherever you want throughout the webinar, if any questions arise, please feel free to enter in a question and then we'll address them uh, as many as we can uh, at the end. So um, with that said, uh, just off the top, a couple Disclaimers that nothing you're hearing today is an offer for investment. It's not sufficient information to make an investment. Um, and there's no representation that uh, we're selling anything to you uh, today. Um, there's even an extra disclaimer specifically for, for Watchdog Capital, which is uh, a broker dealer that also is not representing the company speaking today and is purely for informational purposes. Uh, so, uh, Basically, this isn't an offer to sell anything to you. So um, if you have any further questions about that, please uh, consult these disclaimers. So with that being said, um, today we're gonna go through a few different things, basically looking at the intersection of this growing, maturing institutional demand and how that relates to regulation and government and institutional players entering into the space. It's an auspicious day to speak with uh, ETH reaching its all-time high ever uh, today after a number of years below it, uh, which is, you know, everyone's familiar with the Bitcoin story of institutional growth, but we're starting to see that extend to, to other products as well. Um, so really looking forward, you'll hear from Renee on the rise of the digital dollar and central banks uh, starting to move into that space. And then we'll hear from Bruce with his expertise uh, running a broker dealer on the path for digital securities and tracking securities uh, using a blockchain ledger and, and what that might mean for the future of capital markets and finance. And then ultimately we'll, we'll close with a number of questions from anybody uh, listening today. So just by way of background, I'm Alexander Bloom. I'm the uh, managing director of a hedge fund called Two Prime. We focus on uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, risk management and lending uh, using options trading on, on markets. Uh, prior to being at Two Prime, I ran an investment bank out of New York called Atomic Capital. I've done consulting work for the Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, uh, and it goes on and on, but uh, I'm lucky to work at the University College London as well as the Nexus Global Lab on blockchain. And I would just say I'm super passionate about what digital assets mean for the future, both on a political scale, an economic one, a psychological one, a societal one. I think it's for me an endless well of information and excitement, and it's just amazing to watch it come to fruition uh, over the, the years that I've been working here. Uh, in addition, we'll hear next from Renee today. Renee is the co-founder of Harmonic Chain, which is a venture fund focused on early stage blockchain investments. And she's also the founder and president of NYU Blockchain at the NYU Stern School of Business. Um, and is in the belly of the beast out in New York City. Uh, and is really in touch with what's going on uh, with finance there. And I think has a lot of interesting stuff to tell us today about regulation. And lastly, Bruce is Bio is uh, terse here, but uh, don't let it deceive you. Bruce has been in the blockchain space from very early on, uh, is the founder of the Satoshi Roundtable, which brings together every year some of the best and uh, earliest blockchain investors and technologists throughout the world. I've been lucky to attend a couple of times. Um, and is also the founder and CEO of Chainstone Labs and Atlantic Financial, uh, a broker dealer that focuses on the digital security space as well. So really, to me, an all-star cast, I'm just so grateful to have you both uh, joining today. So um, don't mind that dramatic photo, but despite that, uh, I just want to speak today a bit about growing institutional demand and how the options market is playing into that in a way that speaks to growing maturity and ways to manage risk a little bit better. Um, so you may or not may not be familiar with the stock to flow model, but uh, effectively stock to flow is a way of measuring scarce assets. These are things like gold or real estate, platinum, diamonds, or, you know, diamonds are kind of fake scarce, but you get the point. Uh, and basically it measures a ratio of how much existing supply there is and how much new supply is being introduced on an annual basis. Uh, and basically the more uh, new supply, the less new supply entering that um, 
total supply on a, on a yearly basis, the higher the stock to flow number and the more scarce the thing is in terms of new access to it and tends to be correlated to higher prices of things. So I'm not just telling you this uh, as a general economics lesson, but because it's very relevant to the way that Bitcoin behaves. Bitcoin in its creation has a reduction in 50% every roughly four years, precisely every 210,000 blocks mined where the amount of new Bitcoin generated gets cut in half. And so unlike something like gold or real estate, there's both a known period when the supply changes and it's cut in half right away. Imagine if you're running a gold mining business and overnight you only mine half as much gold, but you still have the same amount of fixed costs uh, as well as the same number of buyers or greater number of buyers trying to acquire less of new supply. What you would see is a rise in the price. Um, so what's been interesting is over the last couple cycles of this, we've seen a logarithmic move upwards in the price of Bitcoin as a consequence of that cut in supply, usually the first 70,000 blocks or first third um, of that new um, circulation regime. So we just entered a new one in May of last year. We're about 35 to 36,000 blocks mined at this point. And we've started to see that logarithmic move uh, upwards in price, which I think is both uh, reassuring for people to give some sense of how you value Bitcoin, as well as uh, helpful in providing statistical models if you're trying to trade or manage risk as to where we're going and, and how we're trading in price. Um, as I, you may or may not know, Bitcoin has a fixed supply in its program from its creation of 21 million Bitcoin, of which over 18 and a half million have been already uh, mined and several million of those permanently lost. And so you're looking at something where there's really very little uh, open supply in circulation being bought by family offices, institutions, corporate treasuries, are all people that we speak to and work with as clients on a regular basis at 2Prime and um, is only growing in, in uh, popularity. ETH is the other um, second largest cryptocurrency is a technical platform for creating decentralized applications. I don't want to get into all of that stuff, but I guess the major thing I want to speak to is one that ETH is currently in a transition to a new consensus algorithm, which requires some of the supply to be locked up and not traded for several years. And so we've seen hundreds of millions of dollars of this ETH be locked up and effectively earning an interest rate for the next few years as they upgrade their platform to their second 2.0 model, uh, which means, again, a diminished supply and an increasing demand uh, tends to correlate to growth in price. And then as Bitcoin rises too, we've seen historically a strong correlation of about 92% correlation between ETH and Bitcoin price. And so um, we, you would expect that as the Bitcoin price falls the stock to flow mile, so would ETH. Uh, it seems to be, as we speak at all time high today, uh, is seems to be following that trend. It's, to me, it's incredibly exciting both for you know, making money, which uh, I like to do, but also just to see these technologies that have been around and saying they're gonna do all these things really grow in price, which means there's more money for investment, more money for exploration and uh, more money to keep important companies in business. This is just a little graph I created, but if you looked at the market cap of Bitcoin today around 690 billion and took the current gold supply and, and shrunk it down to that market cap, it would be effectively like buying gold at $127.65 per ounce. We know gold trades currently at, I think it was about 1835 this morning. Um, but suffice it to say, if you believe Bitcoin can meet the demands that gold does as a supply store of value, or in some cases, I think many believe, including myself, that it has more use than that and can exceed it. Uh, these are just some of the factual price projections of, of where that'll go. Uh, on another scale, just looking at demand, there's a number of significant institutional entrants uh, that are driving both increased retail and institutional adoption. So you see groups like PayPal that have opened up to their you know, multi-million person network of buyers, the ability to buy and sell Bitcoin and Ethereum, as well as uh, Square has done the same. Square also has purchased, uh, I think originally $50 million of uh, Bitcoin for their corporate treasury. We've also seen MicroStrategy as a publicly traded company buy over a billion dollars now of um, Bitcoin for their balance sheet as a hedge against inflation and the diminishing value of the dollar. It also is starting to function. MicroStrategy as a publicly traded ticker symbol allows institutions to effectively buy almost like an ETF of Bitcoin uh, by buying this company that both has business cash flows and 
Bitcoin ba backing the value of their, their company now. Um, and I think their investment has uh, over doubled in just a couple months that they've publicly known to, to hold all this money. They also raised, I think initially it was a $450 million convertible note that was oversubscribed to several hundred million dollars more, which I gotta think is another bear sign for people looking for institutional access to this product. Uh, Grayscale is the largest closed end fund to uh, own Bitcoin. I think the largest Bitcoin holder in the world. Uh, they bought, I think just yesterday alone, 16,000 Bitcoin uh, with hundreds of millions of dollars per week, per month flowing in. I think their whole AUM for their fund is uh, somewhere hovering around 25 billion and growing exponentially. And we also saw a conservative insurance company, Mass Mutual, uh, put over $100 million into one of their funds uh, late last year. So this isn't just cutting edge, tech, cutting edge tech companies. This is sleepy insurance companies that have been around hundreds of years. Um, the last thing I'll speak to is just the options market. At 2Prime, we, we trade options to manage risk on these highly volatile assets for uh, our clients. And we've seen that only really become possible in a, about the last year. The, volume of option liquidity on the major exchanges has increased over 1800% in the last year, which means that if you have, you know, multi-million dollar positions, you can actually get in and get out with, with decent pricing and not incredibly wide spreads. Um, and, you know, for buy and hold strategies that are short term or speculative, it makes sense to maybe just buy Bitcoin and cross your fingers and try to figure out when you think it's at the top. But for people like us that are in this in the long term, you have to have some ability to provide risk management. Uh, and it's nice to see this liquidity growing. We, you know, CME offers Bitcoin options and futures and is just introducing ETH futures. And I suspect we'll introduce ETH options very soon. But, you know, if you're not familiar with institutional markets, this ability to manage risk is a major deterrent to either enter or not enter a market. And as we see this mature, it just indicates that this isn't a short term trend or just a, a fad, but uh, is here to stay and um, will continue to grow. So that is the institutional demand and options aspect of this talk. Next, I'm gonna turn it over to Renee. Renee, so glad to have you joining us. Just let me know when to switch the slides and uh, take it away. Okay. All right, thanks, Alex. Um, delighted to be here. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, delighted to join Alex and Bruce. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is um, first going to give a highlight of the current economic uh, climate, then get into central bank digital currency, what that means, talk a little bit about the digital dollar, and then talk about some current regulation, which really um, we see as accelerating adoption in the digital asset space. So um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Okay, so starting off with just looking at uh, what the current economic climate is telling us, uh, took this graph um, from the Federal Reserve recently. So this is um, the M1 money stock. So as you can see, uh, it's the currency that's in circulation uh, and demand deposits. The US recessions are shaded uh, in gray. The green shading shows where we are currently and is basically just emphasizing the current US uh, printing machine. So you wanna to go to the next slide, please? Um, this is the velocity of money stock for M2. M2 includes both uh, M1. So this is currency in circulation, demand deposits, time deposits, retail money funds and savings deposits. So again, all of the um, recessions are shaded in gray. And if you look at the little green shading at the very end, you'll see that's where we are. So you can see that we've had a significant drop in what this means. This is really the, um, the rate at which consumers and businesses in an economy uh, are collectively spending money. So uh, you can also look at it, it's the number of times $1 is used to purchase final goods and services in GDP. So we have not a great picture lining up so far. Um, the next slide, please. And then finally, this is from the Congressional Budget Office. So to further cap off uh, our dismal economic picture, um, 
This is federal debt as a percentage of G, uh, GDP. And as you can see, um, where we are in uh, the beginning of 2021 is that we're getting very close to World War II level. So, um, so what does this all mean? Uh, and what does it mean for central banks? And why are central banks uh, looking at uh, digital currency? So next slide, please. Um, just to talk about, first of all, what uh, CBDC is, uh, which is central bank digital currency, it's simply fiat currency that's in a digital form. So currently we have an analog system. Uh, platforms like Swift uh, to transfer money are really nothing more than messaging platforms. The actual movement of money is done by central banks. So we currently have a, a correspondent banking model. We have intermediaries in between that debit and credit accounts, which is why it can take three to five days to do cross-border payments. Um, examples of where this has failed, for example, in 2016, we had the infamous Bangladesh central bank heist of $81 million where, uh, where that system failed. So when we talk about CBDC, we talk about both wholesale and retail CBDC. So I wanna just give you a little uh, short explanation of what those mean. So the wholesale CBDC, that's for financial institutions that hold deposits with central banks. How could uh, a CBDC use? Uh, it could be used to improve payments, security settlement efficiency, uh, reduce counterparty credit, liquidity risks. Um, the big idea uh, with uh, a central bank wholesale CBDC is that the token uh, is a bearer asset. So it, what that means is during the transaction, the sender would transfer value to the receiver without an intermediary. Very, very different than our current system in which central banks debit accounts um, uh, without transferring actual value. Uh, the, uh, the wholesale CBDC model is currently the most popular. Uh, it would be the less disruptive and would certainly enable global payments to be quicker, cheaper, more secure. So then we have the retail CBDC. That's issued for the general public. So, um, so this is what we're seeing with China experimenting with the digital yuan. Uh, very popular uh, for emerging economies to look at um, related to financial inclusion uh, and being able to accelerate uh, a shift to a cashless society. On the negative side, um, could also be used to surveil people and their financial transactions. Um, so that's something we'll look at when we talk about uh, the digital dollar. So um, the CBDC stands at a one-to-one -one peg with fiat currency. Uh, it would be easily convertible to commercial bank money and cash. And um, the big idea here is that there would be no need to have a bank account to obtain a CBDC. Um, and I'll talk about that with the digital dollar. So, about 80% of central banks in the world are already looking at uh, CBDC. China is one of the first uh, with the digital yuan. And then other countries that have serious projects are Sweden, Singapore, the Ukraine, Hong Kong, the UAE. Um, the US will not be the first to issue a digital dollar. And the big reason here is because design is critical in the US. We have privacy issues in the US that need to be addressed. At the same time though, regulators know that the US cannot remain analog. Uh, and it's also very important uh, for the US to preserve its reserve currency status as other countries go digital. Um, so those are things that we're looking at. Uh, next slide, please. This is a graph I have taken from the Digital Dollar Project weight paper. Uh, Chris Giancarlo, our former CFTC chair uh, with a group of private and public experts uh, are looking at technology for a digital dollar. Uh, and in this model, 
The important, uh, what I wanted to point out um, to you here is in the token model, you have an instant transfer of value. In the account model, which is what we have currently, um, that's where you have the message that goes first to an operator, such as a commercial bank, and then account balances are debited and credited, then comes the transfer of value. This model, the account model, also involves less lots of uh, rent seekers in between, uh, which a tokenized model could uh, eliminate. So this is one um, idea for uh, a digital dollar. Uh, there are other models being looked at, uh, but this is probably one that involves tokenization and blockchain technology is probably the one that would be uh, most successful in the end. Uh, next slide, please. So why a digital dollar? Um, it would operate uh, alongside existing fiat currency and commercial bank money, uh, would mirror many of the properties of physical money, uh, could be used uh, as a, uh, in a crisis uh, relief situation. Uh, in the US, we have 70 million Americans uh, that needed unemployment relief uh, immediately. And we, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we found that our current infrastructure was old and outdated and uh, it took a long time for people to get money. Um, and the also um, advantage would be there would be no bank account needed. In the US, uh, surprisingly, about 25% of US households are unbanked or underbanked. And that's about 100 million people. Uh, and so it's a, it's a way to address uh, structural inequity. Um, in the US. The big idea here is that on the retail side, my bank account um, can be my wallet, my phone, my computer. Uh, and uh, a digital dollar also could allow for programmable money in that you could use smart contracts such that the money could only be used for things like food, shelter, uh, could help to eliminate fraud, be more efficient. And on the wholesale side, um, again, it really um, deals with reducing risk, uh, addressing time delays, improve liquidity, and provide a more uh, secure system. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between a CBDC and uh, Bitcoin, for example? Um, well, they really are on opposite ends of the scale. A CBDC is centralized or semi-centralized. Uh, you must trust the central institution, meaning the central bank. Uh, it could be potentially sensible transactions uh, and the central bank has the ultimate uh, control. Um, countries like China uh, are using a CBDC to track and trace uh, transactions uh, and their residents. Um, very different than on the other side of the coin, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is decentralized. It's a trustless system. It's uh, immutable transactions and um, considered borderless, not controlled by any one entity uh, and could potentially be used as a hedge to opt out of the current financial system. So uh, very, very different. And then finally, um, go to the next slide. I wanted to point out uh, some current regulation, which um, I consider major inflection points in the adoption of digital assets. Uh, the first one actually came in July by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency in the US. And, and that um, allowed for banks to provide custody services for cryptocurrency. So investors, uh, could in theory uh, ask their institution to custody all their holdings, stocks, bonds, crypto. Um, that was a major barrier to crypto investment uh, removed. September, 2020, uh, the OCC also said that uh, banks could provide services to stablecoin issuers, um, such as holding reserves. And then finally, uh, January 4th, uh, just uh, about over a week ago, uh, the OCC states that uh, banks can run full Bitcoin nodes and use these networks as alternatives to SWIFT, 
ACH payments, Fedwire. So um, what that means is that US banks can use public blockchains uh, and dollar stable coins as a settlement infrastructure in the US financial system. Whoa, that's a huge statement. So it effectively awards blockchains the status of a payment network. So um, the good part here is it allows for diversification of a payment system. Um, so you can have alternate payment rails. Uh, and what the OCC is really doing here, it's hugely accelerating adoption uh, for digital assets in the US financial system. So, um, so I consider these huge um, inflection points that we should all be aware of um, as far as investors and, and, and what the future may hold. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce uh, to talk about digital assets. Oh, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a perfect, the last couple of slides that Renee had um, were, are the perfect segue to uh, talking about securities and how securities can use a blockchain. One of the first things that I recommend that anybody look at when they're looking at any kind of digital token uh, is to first ask what it is. You know, is it, uh, is it a currency? Is it a security? Is it an illegal security? Is it a collectible? Is it something else? Uh, and, that, and then you can analyze it based on other uh, instruments that are peers with that. So, so as Renee mentioned, uh, uh, central bank digital currencies are very, very different than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is very different than securities. So the um, let's go to the first slide here. Um, so with what what makes money good uh, and what makes Bitcoin desirable are these you know, properties of money. And if you Google properties of money, you're gonna find something very similar to this. This predates Bitcoin and has been uh, used by gold bugs and other people for, for a long, long time to, to look at, uh, you know, sort of what money makes sense. Um, and Bitcoin does very well in all these ca categories. It's durable, um, you know, you know on, on computers for sure it's durable. It's hard to uh, destroy Bitcoin unless it's an error or something like that. Very, very portable. You can move it all around the world very easily. Uh, scarcity is one of the biggest points that I think everybody knows about Bitcoin, the 21 million limit, which is a very, very simple thing, but it's a very profound thing when you talk about the world that we're in right now, where you have unlimited fiat being printed and thrown at this wall of immovable scarcity. It's computer code-based scarcity. And we, we haven't really seen that much, especially with an asset of this size. And especially in, we've never, the, the world has never seen these, um, this situation that we're in now with the ra you know radical printing of, of fiat. Acceptability, Bitcoin, that's probably where it's lacking. Uh, as far as money, it's not as widely accepted, but it is accepted in just about every country in the world. So it's probably more accepted than the uh, you know, certainly currencies like the Thai baht, it's it's not ahead of uh, the U.S. dollar, but it's uh, it, it is accepted pretty widely. It's uniform and it's and it's divisible. You can go down to uh, one sat or or less to these tiny amounts that are worth um, worth less. Uh, securities are a very different thing. Securities are based on the, the the terms of the agreement and the enforceable ability of the agreement. Really, that that's it. Terms are the big thing. So if Apple came out with new shares tomorrow and said, these are special super shares, you have 10x the voting power, th that's it. That, I mean, if Apple says it, that that is a very, very valuable instrument uh, because of the terms. Um, Next slide, I think, just covers um, just as is a, is, a, is a similar version of of this kind of you know going into a little bit more detail about you know what makes money money. Um, so back to to securities, which are basically at the end of the day tradable agreements, and that's a really big deal. Um, we don't securities are such a uh, integral part of the way that the world works. And they have been for all of our lifetimes and, and then some for hundreds of years, this has been the cornerstone of, of global finance. I mean, it's right up there with money, uh, securities and money, uh, real estate, you know, the, these are these are just, uh, you know, true cornerstones of the way that, that our world works. And if we look at any success story, whether it's Microsoft or Apple or Google or Facebook, it all uh, comes down to securities. Um, so securities, let's go to the next slide. What, what, what's exciting about securities, securities, um, the first security was the Dutch East India Company. And 
that uh, was with prior to this, basically the way that people finance shipping expeditions was sort of one expedition was financed by one person. And that was very, very risky because you had pirates or the expedition could sink or something like that. And only the very, very wealthy could do it. And, and that sounds like a crazy way to do things, but somebody came up with this incredible invention of uh, basically a tradable agreement. So instead of everybody, you know, somebody putting all their money into one shipping expedition, you could have a bunch of people put their money into several shipping expeditions. And that simple ability of, of enabling risk and reward to be shared is a really, really key part of the way that our world has unfolded. As I mentioned, you know, pretty much any innovation you can think of and any, anything in technology or development and even entire economies, it all comes back to, uh, in modern times, comes back to this, this structure being a very, very important part of it. This ability to share risk and return uh, is very profound. Um, next slide. It was uh, it was profound back in 1637. If you look at what happened to came uh, the 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 largest company the world had ever seen, uh, adjusted for inflation, it's bigger than all of these companies: Google, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, just absolutely stunning. So this is exciting because the the value was sort of there i say sort of there because it wasn't it wasn't all there this actually enabled new value to be created but also unlocked existing value and that's very very exciting we're in an exciting time now where uh, there's a lot of value out there whether it's real estate or smaller businesses and when i say smaller i don't mean just tiny businesses there's a lot of businesses in the deca millions and even billion dollar range that are just private right now for various reasons so what uh, a Dutch East India Company and this invention of something called a security did was unlock this value and enable people to share risk and return in a way that they could not do before. So that's very exciting because it's a cornerstone of the way that the whole global economy works. If you can make that work better, you can make the global economy work better. And, and that that's a very, very, very big deal. And a blockchain may be a way to do that. Uh, blockchains I'm one of the first to say they're not great for a lot of things. They can be very expensive and inefficient. And the overwhelming majority of projects that are trying to sort of build something on a blockchain, in, in my opinion, are uh, probably not going to work. Uh, but I'm all for experimentation, especially if you're not <laughs> ripping people off while you do it. But uh, is in um, replacing the need for a centralized third party to tell you what's true. So historically, actually, I'll go to the next uh, next couple slides. The next slide, basically, I'll just make this quick point. Trade always finds a way. Here's some here's some old um, footage of back when they used to change the the numbers on the stock market uh, wall with uh, chalk. Um, so people want to dis discover value. They want price discovery. They want to trade instruments. They want to share in this risk and return. Uh, system that that I talked about. Now we can go to the next slide, um, and I'll kind of get back to that uh, the, the the point the point I was making. Um, currently, the system is very very complex, and I won't get too much in, into detail. But basically, going back to the point that I was just making, a blockchain can eliminate the need for a third party. So let me just very quickly explain this why this makes sense because a lot of a lot of um, people don't understand it even people in the securities business don't really understand who runs the ledger for your securities if you have 100 shares of apple at a charles schwab account for example how do you know that's real you can trust charles schwab they're a reputable firm but how do they know it's real a lot of people sort of uh, don't really think about this. They assume that maybe Apple has a list. Apple doesn't have a list, actually. Apple doesn't have a list of their shareholders, which is why, by the way, you don't get, you know, if you're if you're a shareholder of, uh, say, Facebook, you don't get emails from from Zuckerberg saying, "Hey, shareholder, how about this and this and this?" You know, you you really the only co communications you get are proxy statements, which the the firms have to hire a consultant actually to find who 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 owns owns their shares. And the reason is because of this this thing that I drew out in a tweet one time, um, this very, very complex system that uh, ultimately, if you have Charles Schwab having a ledger and Merrill Lynch having a ledger and Fidelity having a ledger, 
the, the users can trust those brokers uh, and ex or, or exchanges or um, clearing firms or whoever they're dealing with, but those firms don't trust each other with the with the ledgers. So what's happened several times going back to the 60s and then in, again in 1996, there's been various changes that the bottom line ultimately has uh, made it so that all of these ledgers are run by these trusted third parties. Like in Europe, it's Euroclear, and here in the United States, it's DTCC. So what, what these uh, and, and so so basically, if you own shares of Apple in a Charles Schwab account, what you really have is a is a claim on shares that Schwab has, and then Schwab has a claim ultimately with DTCC. So nobody really owns the securities directly anymore. And that's that's not a huge problem, actually. There has been some problems and there's been some Wall Street shenanigans, but it's not a huge problem that you know issuers or brokers are stealing shares or anything like that. Where the problem is, is that it's, it's very, very complex and very, very slow. So it takes a long time to move things around. So anyway, that that's kind of a just, just, just a quick overview on uh, securities and digital securities, the, the fact that a, a, a decentralized ledger can replace the need for this complex system of DTCC saying what is true, and the ledger says what's true, which is exactly what makes Bitcoin valuable. Bitcoin, uh, you know what's true because you can you can run what's called a node, which basically verifies what's true. And you can see that blockchain that says who owns what. And I think that that is, is very exciting. Uh, it goes well with the narrative of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin is going to become the global money standard or a global money standard, I think it's natural that, you know, you're not going to have people holding Bitcoin as money and then going through these old antiquated systems of taking, uh, you know, 10 days to transfer securities around. I think it's just an, a, an elegant and, and simple system. So I think that um, central bank digital currencies, stable coins and, and regular securities are some of the, the killer use cases of, of blockchains. It doesn't mean that the digital securities themselves are gonna be a boom area. A lot of people say, wow, this is really exciting. Let me invest in those. But, but really every security has to be judged on its own. And a lot of these, um, you know, being that it's the wild west will probably be very, very risky. But over time, I think we'll see a world that's very much more decentralized than it is now, that uh, we, we trust blockchains to tell us what is true and who owns what, and that eliminates some other uh, third parties and middlemen and makes the whole world work in a little bit more frictionless and, and smooth way. So I, I think it's super exciting. I think you can't underestimate it. If you can make securities work better, you can make the whole world work better. And that, that'll enable entrepreneurs to raise money and existing companies to raise money better. It'll enable people to um, participate in the local businesses in their community, uh, enable companies to broaden their cap table and have a lot more shareholders. And we can hopefully be able to move shares around the way we can move crypto around in minutes and hours rather than you know, days and weeks. So I, that's just one thing that I'm excited about, and I think it goes uh, well with the uh, with the rest of the the overall theme. So um, I, I want to thank uh, Alex again and, and Renee, and it's it's great to be here. Okay, well, thank you so much to both of you. That was really informative. Um, now we're going to move into the the Q and A section. Just here on the screen, you can see how to reach out to any of the speakers today if you want to learn more about any of the topics covered or about uh, the companies they run, uh, this is the way to get in touch. We have a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna knock them out here one by one. Actually, got, usually you shouldn't check your phone during a webinar you're leading, but I got one question via email as well, so I'm glad that I did. Um, okay, so the first question we have is gonna be for Renee, and it says, could you pre briefly explain the role of stable coins such as USDT, in relation to the crypto market and can you comment if you're able to on the lawsuits affecting tether and what that could mean for the for the whole industry um sure so uh mo just to address tether well first of all let's go back uh what's a stable coin so a stable coin is something that's pegged to um something such as the us dollar uh, a stable coin could also be pegged to gold, uh, for example. And um, one of the, so regarding Tether, which is supposedly um, pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar, is that um, Tether uh, has not allowed um, a proper auditing 
Uh, and so there's always the question of, of well, is there really one dollar associated with every one tether? Um, that's really important. There are others, um, other stable coins that uh, have come about. Um, Circle, uh, a company that uh, has been working on a stable coin uh, pegged one to one to the dollar, which uh, just made an agreement with Visa uh, to be able to, um, to utilize uh, an easy uh, transfer of payments. So what's a stable coin? What, why is it used? It's, uh, it's a token version uh, of a dollar. And the purpose of it is for uh, uh, ease of, of transfer. So, uh, and there are a whole bunch of different projects, uh, stable coins. Uh, I think there's even one that's pegged to diamonds now, uh, but there are, the most popular are the ones that are pegged to the, to the US dollar. Okay, thanks Renee. Uh, the next one I have here is for Bruce. And the question is, what kind of investments do digital securities make sense for currently? I guess the idea being maybe before things scale, there are things that make more sense now as to perhaps later. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as a big fan of the space, but also somebody who's been in crypto a while, I would say my preference would be things that are um, like, for lack of a better word, non scammy <laughs> you know, really solid. My, one of my fears is that I'm very excited about digital securities, but it's just inevitable that because it is a gold rush and it's a new area, you're going to have, if, if I'm correct, either I'm wrong and nothing happens with digital securities, but if I'm right and it does grow, you're going to have a lot of junk. So that, that I, or, I, I always kind of cringe. I'm worried about a lot of low quality offerings that are sort of just like the worst of what you see in ICOs or DeFi, just becoming a security and saying, oh, now it's legal. We can do anything. So what I hope is that you see, what I'd love to see is things that you, that I look at as an investor or as an investment professional. And I look at and say, oh, great, that's a good Maybe not something I'd buy, but that's a good fairly priced deal. Like I'd love to see, you know, a, a publicly traded company have a digital uh, portion of their publicly traded, because then you know it's it's got real value. Whether you like the company or not, it has public value. Another thing that would be good is real estate. Another thing that would be good is sort of mid-market companies that are too small historically for for IPOs and not enough growth potential, but they're good solid businesses. You know, every city has the the local, you know, paper mill or something that's doing 10 or 20 million in revenue. And it's just doesn't, there's no way to unlock that value. So that's what I'd like to see. I think it could be good for any kind of security, but um, uh, you know, from an entrepreneur side, probably the, the hottest thing would be something like a startup or something like that. You may get some extra interest, but you know, as an investor, I'd, I'd probably gravitate towards the more conservative kind of things that, that have, uh, you know, really solid value, hopefully. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's one here that I'm going to take, which is uh, how, how are derivatives used to manage risk? Uh, I guess referring to Bitcoin or Ethereum. So, you know, for some background, there's you know there's some options in futures markets for other cryptocurrencies, but if anything of any real volume, uh, we're talking you know hundreds of millions of dollars of daily trading volume. The Bitcoin and Ethereum are really the only two that. Are at scale. Uh, like I mentioned, there's both the CME and BACT in the United States that offer some of these products, and then the leading by volume because it's a lower barrier to entry. You don't need you know a hundred thousand or half a million dollar buy-in uh, is is Deribit, where you see more retail options trading, but also represents a lot of the volume. Um, in the case I can speak to what we do at Two Prime, you know the main most known way to like protect downside is by buying puts. And so at two prime, for example, we buy puts, but puts aren't free. And so, especially when you have something going up quickly as in the bull market we're now, you have to ask, how do you finance these puts, especially with really high implied volatilities? Uh, what we try to do is take advantage of that, what's called Vega, or basically the value of a high volatility thing. You can sell options for high prices just because things move around so much that the odds are at some point it might be a valuable option and so what we're able to do is finance puts using uh, Vega premium. Um, we're at the same time maintaining some of the upside or you know, we aim for 80 to 90% correlation on the upside. Uh, and so in this way we can kind of trail the options or the underlying market of the, the asset upwards while still kind of almost putting a floor on the price. So like I can promise you even during bull markets, you see 20, 30% drawdowns in the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum regularly 
you know, usually five to eight per, you know, one to two year bull cycle. And so even if things are going really well, there's going to be periods where it crashes, just like we had a couple of weeks ago. Everyone's gonna be like, oh, this thing is dead for the thousandth time. But these are actually opportunities, if you know what you're doing, to capture more Bitcoin and Ethereum so you can write it up higher. And again, we uh, you can look into the kind of the Greeks of options, but uh, through Vega, you can do this. The, the last aspect of what we do is look at um, where we are in that happening cycle and standard deviations above the last uh, move that we made in the previous happening cycle and put some parameters around risk. Okay, we're 80% to a projected max peak here. We're going to increase the hedge that we are doing on the downside because the likelihood of it occurring soon is increasing and we're willing to take a little less of the upside in order to make sure we don't lose it all. First and foremost, just trying to preserve wealth, uh, not get lost in the, the gold rush that that Bruce mentioned. Um, so I hope that made sense. Uh, if not, you can always follow up by, by email with me. Um, so the next one is going to kind of go to both Bruce and Renee. Um, Bruce, you said something about um, basically mid-market companies avoiding IPOs. And this question is basically, are there any important regulations coming underway or that could drastically affect either uh, CBDCs or digital securities? What comes to mind for me, Bruce, is like changes to Reg A plus that allow for raises to happen higher. But I, I wonder if there are any other regulations or things that, that investors and, and the market should be uh, keeping an eye on. Sure, there's a few things. Renee could probably talk about OCC and uh, FinCEN on the on the stablecoin side. For securities, um, a couple of things I'm mo most excited about are there, the, the changes in the definition to accredited investor, which has historically been 200, 000, basically 200,000 in income or a million dollars in assets. And that's being loosened now to include certain professionals, like if you work at certain um, types of funds or family offices, uh, as well as um, if you've taken certain exams like the Series 7 exam, and they're, they're opening the door to, to making that more broad. Uh, and they've also increased the limits, as you mentioned, for Reg A, Reg A+, plus, um, Reg D, and Reg CF. So Reg CF, for example, you can now raise up to $5 million with You have to meet certain criteria, but you can raise up to $5 million from non-accredited investors uh, using either a crowdfunding platform or, or through a broker-dealer. So uh, that, that's really exciting. I personally believe that investors should be able to buy anything they want. The world, um, you know, you can buy lottery tickets, you should be able to buy uh, startups. The world allows people to access a lot of information. So I, I think that's exciting um, because there is so much value that can be unlocked. And now that you have these limits, like with Reg A going up to 75 million, uh, yeah, that's, that's real money. Even 5 million for Reg CF, it's so small that I mean, it's so simple to do one that it might be worth it even for a larger company, you know, who, who wouldn't want an extra 5 million bucks on their balance sheet. You know, maybe you buy some Bitcoin with it or something. But um, so I'm, I'm excited about those those exemptions uh, and, 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 and just the acceptance of, of digital securities overall as these major companies like Fidelity and others have, have moved into it. Uh, I'm optimistic about it moving forward. Any other any others, Renee? Well, yeah, there are a couple things I think um, that we should keep a watch on. Uh, one is currently money transmitters. Money transmitter licenses in the U.S. are done state by state. Um, we'll see if that changes, uh, of whether it becomes um, uh, a federal um, license. Uh, it has prevented many companies from becoming money transmitters just because of the uh, the amount of money and uh, the amount of capital and time involved in getting these. Um, so, and that certainly relates to uh, the current OCC um, regulations um, regarding opening up um, what exactly a, a payment rail could look like. And then I think um, the other is the Howey test. The Howey test in the US, um, as far as determines what is a security. Uh, and I know XRP has been in the news because uh, the SEC came down and said, okay, uh, XRP, you are a security, uh, which is why all of the exchanges are delisting XRP. So we'll see if that changes. Um, my guess is that it probably is going to have to be um, altered in some way um, such that, and I know the SEC is already looking at this, we have Gary Gensler coming in as the um, new chair of the SEC. 
He's uh, very, very educated on crypto uh, and is a friend of the crypto community. Uh, so we'll see if we get different regulations, uh, just um, making uh, it more clear as to um, what um, crypto can and cannot do and what's a security and what's not a security. Okay. Um, great. The next question I have here with the last nine minutes of this uh, webinar is for Bruce and says, can, is it safe for brokers to custody security tokens? Uh, that's a great question. So the brokers need certain permissions and um, so, so to, to be, to deal with securities, you have to be a registered in the United States, you have to be registered with the SEC and governed by FINRA and uh, both the SEC and FINRA have restrictions on who can do what, and, and uh, so, so the, the the bottom line is it's not very easy for a, a broker to simply um, hold, hold digital securities. The answer of whether it's it's risky or not really depends on the type of security. What what's interesting is that I, when I first became interested in this, I was thinking that securities would end up being digital um, bearer assets, basically. But there's a lot of drawbacks of bearer assets. They may end up being bearer assets in some form, like maybe a bearer asset that can also bring your ID with you and somehow be controlled by the issuer. But that's not really flushed out yet. Bearer assets like Bitcoin have tremendous drawbacks. And for, for most broker dealers, they're not able to... Um, you know, they don't have the security procedures or systems in place to, to do this. Um, my mom was a broker in uh, 1977. And, and when I was a little boy, her firm got robbed. Somebody came in there with a gun and tried to rob some securities. And I'm betting, or maybe they, I think they got some cash because they used to take cash back then. But I'm betting that was probably one of the last armed robberies of a brokerage firm. Nobody Nobody robs a brokerage firm now. You can't, you go into Fidelity or Schwab, you can't, there's nothing to rob uh, because they don't have any bearer assets and they haven't for a long, long time. They don't have cash either. So um, so I, I, I'm hoping that it becomes safe for brokers to custody these things. I'd love to custody them as a broker, but I'd need for FINRA permission. Uh, and I also, you know, I don't think most, uh, there's no way in a billion years I would custody Bitcoin personally. Um, it's just way too much risk, in my opinion. I, I don't want to worry about my own personal safety and things like and this is I'm a pretty longtime Bitcoiner, so so I don't take that statement lightly. But um, but I, I, I think that the good news is that that because the securities are more centralized and you trust the issuer already, I think they will be a lot safer to move around and safer to custody than um, than, than than assets like Bitcoin. Okay, thank you. The next question I'm gonna take a swing at and feel free to chime in either of you is given China's dominance of the mining infrastructure and hashing, what are the chances of a 51% attack? Uh, this came both on here and to my personal email somehow. So, you know, I would say there's a couple of things. One is a question of incentives, maybe just to frame it, a 51% attack is that, you know, if over 50% of the mining power of the Bitcoin network is co-opted or dominated by one group with one interest, they have the ability to revise or put um, non-accurate information into the Bitcoin blockchain and, and verify it under the blockchain consensus uh, algorithm being used. And so it could be, you know, maybe if I own 51%, I might be my interest to say, ah, now today I own 99% of all the Bitcoin because I just decided to transfer it over. So I guess there's two aspects to whether or not this is a risk. One is just a question of incentives. So if I own something that's incredibly valuable, um, then it's not in my interest to break the whole system because then it's not very valuable anymore. And so if I'm the one with the most money or the most hash power in this thing, which means millions and billions of dollars in investment in computing power, storage, facilities, electricity costs, I don't want to screw that thing up overnight. I think it's also important to realize, yes, China is a different kind of government, but it's not like there's just one guy in China with a switch that turns on all the Bitcoin mining power. And so though there is a lot of uh, controlled hash power over in China, it's not necessarily so easy to just take over 51%. And again, its incentives aren't um, aligned with that. And I'd say secondarily, there are increasing numbers of mining facilities taking place in the United States and elsewhere as the value of Bitcoin goes up and becomes more profitable. There are groups even taking natural gas flares uh, from real oil uh, rigs and taking the natural gas and converting into Bitcoin mining. There's, I know, um, 
major investment into groups like Layer One here in the United States with giant mining facilities in Texas and Washington, places with inexpensive electricity. And so the competition for mining is also increasing over time throughout the world as it becomes more profitable to do so and to fight over that last basically two and a half Bitcoin, two and a half million Bitcoin left to be mined. Uh, so I don't see that as a major risk just because of the incentives and, and growing competition. And even within China, some of the decentralization of that mining power, though um, it's certainly something to, to keep an eye on. Uh, I'm not sure Bruce or Renee, if you have anything to, to add to that. Okay. Um, so then the next question maybe for Renee is, and it's probably our last question of the day is, um, how do you spend cryptocurrency? For example, after I invest and it goes up, but I want to cash out some crypto into the US dollar, how do I get my dollar? Oh, okay. Well, um, you've got to do an exchange. You've got to go to some type of on off ramp. And those are the exchanges today, um, which is where uh, also the KYC AML um, exists. Um, so those are the those are the current rails to go from crypto to let's say U.S. dollar or or euro, uh, for example. It's the exchanges. Okay, well that was quick. So maybe there's time for one more um, to Bruce. So well, there's a quick one. There's two prime except outside investors, and I would say that I encourage you to reach out. Um, but this is not an offer for investment. It's just for informational purposes. Um, so lastly, for, for Bruce, when will digital securities reach scale? That's a great question. I, I, a few years ago, I thought it would have been by now, but now I think it's gonna be even longer than I thought. Um, it takes a long time. A lot of these approvals, it's, it, I'm all, always in the US. So um, approvals in the US take you know, six to nine to 18 months for various things for, for exchanges and brokers. Uh, to be able to do the things that they need to do. There's a lot of different market participants in the ecosystem. It is very new and you need kind of a critical mass for the uh, exchanges to, to, to be able to do something that's, that's sort of notable. Uh, however, there's a lot of companies working on this space. There's, there's several new exchanges. There's the new regulatory changes that we've mentioned. There's new technology that we didn't have. So it's a very, very old and tradition bound and very important industry with decatrillions of dollars at stake. Uh, so it stands to reason that it's going to be slow to evolve, but I think the writing is on the wall. It, it will evolve, it is evolving. And it's it's actually, securities have changed more in the last year than they've changed in the previous 85 years. So that's, it doesn't seem like that much compared to you know DeFi and all these other things, but securities are changing very radically before our eyes. And that's a very big deal. So I think in a few more years, we're gonna see um, you know, as the former SEC chair, Jay Clayton said, everything will be tokenized. Um, I'd add to that, that everything will be tokenized and hopefully settling in Bitcoin. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, that wraps up the webinar for today. I'm just going to put back on the screen. Uh, if you want to get in touch with any of us, here are our Twitter handles as well as emails or, or Bruce's website. Uh, I really appreciate both of you so much for sharing. Uh, I think sometimes the regulation and kind of the underlying mechanics of how money and agreements work, it can get really dull, but to understand like this is the trading of agreements is such a weird thing, or this is the movement of a dollar digitally and how that actually works has been informative to me. And I just really thank you both so much. Thank you, this is really great. Appreciate yeah. uh, being invited. Thanks. Yeah. So. Um, and yeah, you can reach out to any of us. I see there's about 20 questions we didn't answer. So uh, feel free to be in touch directly and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Uh, next month, Bruce mentioned proxy voting. Uh, we're going to be having another webinar with the Chief Strategy Officer of Broadridge Financial. Uh, they recently managed proxy voting and proxy information for almost every large company, publicly traded company. So looking forward to how they're using blockchain uh, next month. So stay tuned and we will see you next time. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.